We're studying themes from the book of Genesis, from the first book of the Bible. But we're doing this not because we're interested simply in, in looking back at ancient history, but we want to understand these basic themes of Genesis because we know that the entire rest of sacred Scripture flows out of what happens in Genesis. Genesis is the foundation <laughs> upon all of these things of the Christian faith rests. And so it's important for us to go back to our roots, to our origins, to our Genesis. The very word Genesis tells us something about what we will be examining. That word in itself is not a Hebrew word. It comes from the Greek, and the Greek word there is ganao or ginomai, which means simply to be, to become, or to happen. And that's what the author of Genesis is trying to teach us, where our being comes from, how the world became a world, how it happened originally and ultimately. Now, we're not concerned here with matters of mythology or fairy tales. The Bible doesn't talk the way we talk in our traditional fairy tale motifs where we say to our children, once upon a time. Have you ever thought of that formula, once upon a time? It's kind of an awkward uh, form of speech, isn't it, that, that, that we don't say once at a certain time or once in the midst of time, but once upon a time? That's the temporal location. It's awkward. It's disjointed. It doesn't fit. It takes us into the land of Never Never Land. But that's not how the Bible speaks. The Bible begins at the beginning establishing its content in history. Let's look at the text. In the opening words of Genesis, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Almost everybody in America has heard and perhaps even memorized that opening line of sacred Scripture, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We often overlook the fact that in that statement, the gauntlet is thrown down the challenge is made to all theories of secular philosophy, and at this moment, from the very first line of Scripture, the Judeo-Christian faith is set on a collision course with secular views of nature and of the cosmos. In the beginning, God, the, the very association of beginning with God may be confusing at the outset because we know that God has no beginning. God transcends to, uh, the, the temporal movements of history. God is eternal. But yet the Bible says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning refers to the advent of cosmic history. Now, at that point, we already have conflict with various forms of secular philosophy. I think even in the ancient world of the Greeks who understood that the world had no beginning. They operated on a different, indeed a radically different understanding of time. For the Greek, history moved as a cycle. And we call that a cyclical view of time. As opposed to the Greek view, the Hebrew understanding of history was linear. Now, what's the significance of that? Very quickly and very briefly, for some of the ancient Greeks, not all, but most of the ancient Greeks, the pattern of history was this cycle of endless repetition where the world goes round and round and round and round. It has no definite point of beginning and no ultimate point of destiny. 
but it's an endless, monotonous repetition of the same things over and over again. The entire world is going around in circles, going nowhere. But that, as I say, is on a collision course with the Hebrew concept of history where we say there is a point of beginning and that that movement of history is moving inexorably toward a determinant goal, towards the consummation of the kingdom of God, towards a destiny that our Creator has established from the foundation of this world, and that along this line of history there are moments that are pregnant in meaning where, where redemption is unfolding and taking place. But the first intersection of time and eternity takes place here at the beginning when the eternal God creates the heavens and the earth. Well, let's look at that part of the text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Some would look at that and say, well, this is simply a brief portrait of just a small segment or aspect of the created order whereby God, through His creative activity, shapes the planet earth with the sky above us. But it says nothing of all of the rest of the planets and galaxies in the entire universe. But that's not the thrust of the text. What the Hebrew is saying with the expression and with the phrase, the heavens and the earth, is that he is saying that God has created out of nothing the entire substance of what is. Now, I mentioned that we have conflict, that we have collisions between Christianity and secular worldviews in our day. And one of the, the great issues of our day is the issue of whether or not the universe has come to pass through the creative and intelligent work of an eternal God or whether it just popped into existence out of nothing. One of the axioms of philosophy is the phrase ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing, nothing comes. But because there is a God who creates, we have substance rather than nothing. There is a world rather than a vacuum. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's a very positive statement, and it's an exciting statement. It's electric as it, it, it compresses into one statement that extraordinary and perhaps the extraordinary act that defines human history, the act of creation. But it's also an introductory statement as the rest of the uh, opening chapters of Genesis begin to unfold and fill in the, in the structure and the skeletal outline that is offered for us in the thematic statement in verse 1. But as soon as we move to verse 2, there is an obvious change a sudden shift in the tone of the text. Note how positive and triumphant verse 1 is. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But we read verse 2, we step into another realm. Listen to the text. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Let's look at that clause. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Some of you may be aware, of course, that the book of Genesis is not the only uh, document from antiquity that gives us uh, 
an account of creations. We think of the Babylonian creation epic and others in which we see a clear uh, view of mythology in which creation takes place out of an internal struggle of the eternal dualism between the forces of darkness and the forces of light equal beings of good and evil that are involved in an endless power struggle. And in some of those myths of creation, we see the battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, between the force of order and the force of chaos, between the deity and the sea monster who lurks in the darkness of the waters. And for that reason, some have said, well, here we have the same thing here in Genesis. We have just another mythological account of a struggle between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. But those who have examined the text carefully argue that the book of Genesis is already a demythologized document, that it, it, that it uh, has uh, a curious difference from the characteristics that are found in pagan myths of creation. Yes, there are references here to darkness. There are references here to the deep, to the waters. There is reference here to the void, to the emptiness. But there's not even a hint of some kind of co-eternal power between the forces of chaos and the forces of order. The God who creates has sovereign power over what he creates. And so we say, what is the point of verse 2? Is it to show us that God somehow prevailed over a primordial struggle with the forces of chaos? Or do we have here rather a description of the stages of creation where, as one theologian has pointed, that perhaps what the author of Genesis is showing us is the triumph of God over any possibility of ultimate chaos. Yes, as soon as God begins His work of creation, before it is finished, He sets the, the raw material, the substance of the universe before Him. There is an earth, but it is yet not shaped, that it's not formed, it hasn't been finalized in the creative plan of divine architecture. And in the initial stages, God looks at what that first step of the universe is, and there is still yet formlessness as we see the clay of the sculptor as he begins his work. But before the sculptor can produce a statue, he has to first find clay so that God's first act of creation is the substance out of which He will form and shape and mold the universe according to His divine plan. But if all we had was substance with no order, we would still be left with nothing more than the conditions of chaos, a world without form, without shape, a world of emptiness, a world of darkness. It's ironic, nay, it's tragic, that in our own century, with the rise, for example, of existential philosophy, we have heard the voices over and over again in our culture who say that creation really never got beyond that stage. There are people who are still telling us that ultimately life is chaotic, that there is no purpose, there is no meaning to human existence. I think of Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher of the 19th century, the one who is identified with the statement that God is dead. Nietzsche looked at the civilization of his day and the decadence of modern man and he was driven to a point of despair, saying that life is ultimately meaningless, that chaos is supreme. 
And so he became the father of what is called modern nihilism. Nihilism simply means nothingnessism. Nietzsche said the final verdict of the significance of mankind is das Nichtige, the nothingness. That's why since Nietzsche and since apostles of despair have peddled their wares in our day, that some scholars have been quick to point out here that in the second verse of Genesis, the, the possibility of ongoing emptiness exists for a moment, at least theoretically. That in it is this as yet unfinished, unordered, unstructured symphony that God conducts. There is the threat of chaos. The world is formless and void, empty, and darkness hangs over the deep. But as I read my text of Genesis, it does not say the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep, period. It says the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep, semicolon. There is another clause to be added. And it is the adding of that clause that differentiates the Christian from the existentialist, the Jew from the nihilist, the believer from the secularist. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Now, you may have a different translation in your, in your Bible between, or apart from moving. I've seen translations that say, and the Spirit of God was brooding over the deep or over the water. And a, another very popular translation is that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And another one suggests that the Spirit of God was sweeping across the water. Now, there's a reason for those different uh, interpretations or different translations, because the word that is used here in the text is one that is very infrequent in the Bible, but it is found later on in the prophets and is used on one occasion to describe the activity of eagles as they care for their young. And you see the, the, the image of the mother eagle hovering over the nest hovering there to protect, to feed, to nurture, and to nourish her young. As a hen broods over her chicks. The idea here is that as God forms their shapes and calls into existence the substance of the universe, but before that substance passes from formlessness into structure and to order, into harmony and into beauty. The Spirit of God descends upon this threat of chaos, on the emptiness, and the Spirit of God fills the emptiness. The Spirit of God forms the formless, and the Spirit of God banishes the darkness. He hovers intimately over the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, notice that the Bible doesn't give us a mechanical description of exactly how God brought the universe into being. The means by which He performed this supernatural act of creation, we can only describe in theological terms by calling to the text what we say is the divine 
fee on. I'm not talking here about an automobile, but we're talking about a command. The word fiat means the divine imperative. How does God create? He commands the universe to come into existence. He says, let there be, and there is. Do you see why throughout the rest of Scripture, again and again and again, the call of God, the voice of God, the Word of God is seen to be such a powerful force, not only that it can create and form, but it can transform, that it can bring something out of nothing and life out of death. How does Jesus bring Lazarus from the tomb? He doesn't use mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. What does he do? He walks up to that tomb where the body of Lazarus is contained, where the body is rotting, where it stinks, according to Scripture, and Jesus cries in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And this corpse stands up and bursts the bonds of his grave clothes and walks out alive, life out of death. How? By command. Christ says to the turbulent waters that threatened to capsize the boat in which he and his disciples were, were traveling, he says, peace, be still. And the disciples say, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? He has the power of the Creator to command, and by the sheer authority of his sovereign voice, things happen. And so the author of Genesis is calling to our attention not only the generating power of God, but the authority of God. Note the word authority. It's built upon the root, author. You see, God has authority over that which He authors. He brings the substance of the universe out of nothing by virtue of the divine fiat, the divine imperative, let there be light, and there was light. Now, in classical Christian theology, we look at creation, and we say that creation takes place ex nihilo, ex nihilo, which means literally out of nothing, out of nothing. But you say, wait a minute, just a minute ago you chided the secularists for advocating a doctrine of the universe by which he says that the universe comes into being out of nothing. And you said that that concept violates one of the most fundamental of all philosophical, not to mention scientific principles, ex nihilo, nihil fit. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Sophisticated scientists in the 18th century said the universe came into being through spontaneous generation. Even more sophisticated scientists today and many circles are suggesting that we can no longer hold to an idea of spontaneous generation, that the universe has come into being by chance, by chance. And I ask them, what are the chances out of a universe coming into being by chance? And the answer, of course, is not a chance. Chance cannot create anything. In fact, not only can chance not create anything, chance cannot do anything. Why not? Why can't chance do anything? Because it has no power. It has no power because it has no being. Chance is nothing. 
It's only a word that we use to describe mathematical possibilities, but it's not a being, it's not a thing that has a capacity for action or power or for thought or anything else. It's nothing. It is no thing. And yet, people today will say the whole universe has come into being out of nothing in the sense that the power for its existence comes from nowhere. It's like the rabbit out of the hat, except for one problem. Not even a magician present to bring the rabbit out of the hat. You see, the problem that modern man faces is a problem of causality. It's a problem of causality. And the issue today is whether or not the universe caused itself from nothing without the presence of any sufficient or inefficient causal power or agency to bring it about, or whether or not there is an eternal, transcendent, self-existent, sufficient and efficient power to do the job. What the Bible says is this, yes, there was a time when no material universe exists. But there was never a time, there, well, let me put it this way, there was a time when nothing existed, but never a time when no one existed. God is not a thing, but He is a being, and God is eternal. And when the Bible says, or when the theology teaches that creation is ex nihilo, that means that God did not use some pre-existent matter or substance out of which to, to bring the universe. But even that substance, that core, that matter, that energy, whatever it was, was dependent for its being upon the eternal being of God. And that God brought that substance out of nothing. He is not nothing, but the universe did not exist until He created it. The modern version says, out of nothing and from nothing and by nothing came everything. No wonder, without an intelligent, eternal, rational God, the destiny that modern man looks for without God is chaos. Where the end of this planet will be like the beginning, waste and void, emptiness and darkness on the face of the earth. But God said, let light, and the lights came. I will try to, there's another place that I can uh, get that video, mm -hmm. and I'll try to get it there and see if it works better than, um, uh, than this one did. I like the point he uses there, when you use the phrase, once upon a time, that indicates that the time always there's always been there, but then he then he in the beginning is the beginning. But there, there's time is time is not. We're studying in. themes from the book of Genesis, from the first book of the Bible. But we're doing this not because we're. In like I said, this is a work in progress. Um, uh, you were saying, Bob, that when you say when he, I like the way he phrased it. This when you, when you, you come up and say, "Once upon a time," what does that indicate? The time always was. No matter where you put once time, there's always time. But then he came back. Creations in the beginning. They're, they're in the beginning. Yes. There's there's a beginning. Yeah, um, nothing here. I want to want to. Uh, how, how did he say the uh, Jewish historian looks at things? Looks at the world. Linear. Linear. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's a line with a beginning. Let's see what I did here. And then, and he didn't say it was an end, did he? What did he say? Well, it's going to, what we know now is going to end, but I mean, it's something Yeah, else. but what's, what's going to happen? There's, there's, there's something in sight. There's a goal yeah. in sight. So there was a goal. Now, how does the Greek philosophy look at the world? Circular. Circular. So it looks like this. Let me, uh, let me read a few lyrics from a song. It wasn't a real popular song, um, but it was there just the same. Uh, do any of you remember Harry Chapin? Mm -hmm. Okay, I liked Harry Chapin. I liked a lot of his music. And this particular song, I liked, and I didn't think much about it. Mm -hmm. And when you put this together, I don't think Harry Chapin was writing this necessarily um, because he was thinking this way. But the, this, this, um, the song is called Circles, and it starts out, all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown, moving through, rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. Um, all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. Okay? Now, when we think about that in relationship to the world and how people are responding to things, um, why do you think there are people that think this way rather than this way? If you go by the song, his, he's still moving linear. You can be a circle, but he's still rolling linear. I understand the song. <laughs> well, um, actually, he feels a song like he's in a rut. No, actually, here, here. Uh, it seems like I've been here before. I can't remember when, but I have this funny feeling that we'll all be together again. No straight lines make up my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I didn't read that one yeah. yet. And all my roads have bends. There's no clear cut beginnings, and so far, no dead ends. Yeah. Okay, so he would, yeah, yeah, he would make a good Hindu. Yeah, yeah, and and whether or not he was thinking like that, or he was just creating something that he was that was in his <laughs> mind, the idea is that people hear that song and they say, "Wow, it's good. You know, it sounds good." It's, it's all my life's a circle, sunrise into now. You know, nice catchy tune. And people will listen to it, and they'll get this in their mind that life's just a circle. And there's no hope in the circle. There's no beginning. There's no end. Okay? So when we talk about history in a linear sense, there is a beginning. And there is going to be a goal. And that's what we talked about last week, didn't we? Hope. Oh. Right, but in, in sacred music, you've got a beginning and a, this yeah. is leading you somewhere. A lot of the modern music is, it's basically a music. It's just you're yeah. going around and around. You see nothing. You There's a, remember the song, um, Little Boxes? Little Boxes on oh, the hillside. Side. Little, little boxes, boxes made of ticky tacky. People living in these boxes and they all go to work and they all yeah. come home. I mean, it's this sense of, perpetuating a circle, yeah. but you never have a goal. Yeah. And it's always, it's like a rut. You and you know it. what? How old is that song? Oh, God. That's 50, 50 years old. Yeah, it was probably six. Well, it's in the 60s. It was in the 70s. It was in the 70s. No, it was in the 60s. It was yeah. in the 60s. And it was, <clears throat> yeah, I, I want to say it was the Kingston Trio. No, so, it wasn't the Kingston yeah. Trio. It was, um, oh. And come out of the folk era. Yeah. Yeah. Era. yeah. yeah. But it was, it was early. early. I, think, I think it was 50s. I think it was late 50s. 
but all it's it, it was. You know what's interesting is it's, it's when we started um, our journey into Christianity. It was in a Christian songbook. Oh yeah, it's in the, yeah, it was in the young <laughs> song. Yeah, that was so it circles. Yeah, so it circles. And you're like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> any other any other thoughts? Logically, because I don't I don't particularly know music. Yeah. I mean, uh, in high school, I wasn't into it either. But it, okay, your life may be a circle, but you're still moving linear. Well, you live, li yeah, that life, because why, why is this the way we live? Because it's what? It's correct. It's correct, or? It's true. It's truth. Yeah. This is truth. I mean, because even if I'm going in a circle, I'm not going back to when I was 50. Right. You know, but I, that's, I, I'm, I'm but, moving, yeah. But you, now, do you understand when people have been listening to this type of music, or, or maybe they've watched a TV show that has that type of theme, Cosmos. or a, a, uh, a movie, or literature, that, that is, is based in this type of thinking as opposed to this, because what's out there? Non-truth, non-truth. This is, this is truth. That's that why. song was sung by Pete Seeger okay. in 1962. Okay, so we split the difference. <laughs> It's a typical yeah. Pete Seeger yeah. song. I mean, yeah. He didn't write it, but they some yeah, I, somebody else sang it too. I, I heard a group sing it. There's another group sing it. Yeah, I, I, it was, I think it was the Kingston Trio. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and see, the Kingston Trio sang good, good music. They were not, uh, they weren't a druggy kind of outfit. And yet they were, and see, all these, all these groups would sing songs that they didn't know what the philosophy behind them were. Or was they had no idea what the philosophy was? I, I beg to differ. I believe they I would think, know. I think there's some, some, but a lot of them just sang the songs. Uh, yeah, I understand that, but if they sang it with a with an understanding of what they were talking about. They really mm -hmm. did. But the hearers so. probably the hearers yeah. were like catchy tune. I'm just yeah. going to sing about yeah. it. But I think but, they kind of knew. But I, I think a lot of the songs they didn't really understand what. They were singing. They I didn't have a little clear. I think on. I think both of you are right. I think they did understand to a degree, but I think they haven't contemplated deeply. Right. I think. Uh, I think I think, it's, I I, completely. Yeah, I, think yeah, I think some of the folks. It was as from like Pete Seeger and some of those folks. Then it became the norm. For, for groups to, to really yeah. become. Yeah. Seeger was a card carrying communist. Yeah. We used to see him all the time with Piketty, him and Don McLean walking around Main Street. Yeah. He visited our church once in a while. He did. He was, a, he was a, an acquaintance of our music director, a black lady, gospel singer. And I'm sitting up there with the five elders with our suits on. And I look down the front row and I says to our pastor, who was a young guy, it's Pete Seeger sitting there. He says, Pete who? I said, Never mind. <laughs> I said, you mean Bob Seeger? No, no, just preach. <laughs> Speed Seeger. This yeah. profound atheist was yeah. sitting in our front pew. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what he did, but I heard. Yeah. And you, you probably you listen to music though. You, you never you didn't even listen to music? Where have oh. all the flowers gone? Yeah. Go yeah. on, yeah. yeah. the soldiers go on yeah. the grid. Yeah. Bring the graveyards, everyone. Yeah. Yep. Pizza. When will they ever when will learn? They ever learn? Yeah. When well, that is an anti war. Yeah. 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 He was definitely yeah. a strange dude. So, <laughs> um, so, anyway, I mean, there's when we think about this and we think about creation and everything, there's a lot to it. It's not just the idea that, oh, okay. You know, God created, and then we have to leave it there. We have to understand that the world says that creation happened out of nothing. But the philosophers said nothing comes from nothing. 
So, so they're like contradicting themselves anyway. And so, there, so there's a problem there. But we need to understand that the, the, the uh, uh, God is eternal. God is eternal. So he was the cause. Talk about causality. He was the cause. And since he was eternal, he was there. And he spoke it. Because why? Why could he speak it? He had to think it first. But why could he speak it? Because he had the power to speak it. He had the power to speak it. Mm -hmm. the power to speak it. Well, let's see what... Uh, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Did you ever think about that before today like yeah. that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of icky, but uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Connell, uh, he was a, a Greek expert. It's he's moving. It's like on the wedding night, the bridegroom hovering over the bride before the at the moment of consummation, and that's in Hebrews. What's describing was the spirit of God that brought life and created. Okay, so it's kind of an icky thing. You want all adults in the room. But Dr. Otto says, to, to, to us, it's kind of, Ugh, but to the Hebrews, they understood that. Yeah. Okay. And it was an act of creation. But then even the way that um, R.C. described it was like a, 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 a mother hen or yeah. hovering mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. and loving and caring for, which is the same thing. It's about the hovering means the spirit yeah. of God was about to perform the creative act. Yeah. Could the universe have come into being from nothing? Why or why not? Well, nothing can no. lie. It's kind of one Yeah. It was, what did he say? The uh, divine fiat. Right, right. This is my command. And if you own a fiat, you know that's not divine. Pardon? If you own a fiat, you know that's not yeah. divine. Yeah. <laughs> well, the president rules by executive fiat. Man, yes, yes. Yeah, he makes a decision. Yes, yes. yes. Does it matter if the creation account of Genesis is true? Of course. It, there's nothing else that matters more. Right. Right. It has to be. If it's not true, then nothing that follows is necessarily true. Well, if you want, if, you want, if, it's, if it's not true, it makes God a liar. Right. Because we have you speaking to us through. through. And, right. And if it's not true, where are we? Yeah, there's no purpose to anything. Yeah, including us. Right. Okay. Um, could the universe have come into being from nothing? Um, oh, why is it significant that creation has a beginning? Because there's a beginning. It makes it that way. There, there, there's stability in. Mm -hmm. Um. And it means that. It just didn't happen. You know, they might say this is how it began, a big bang theory. They still haven't answered the question, where did it come from? What yeah. was before it? The opening line in Cosmos, I always remember that because I was a big Cosmos fan. Sagan says, the Cosmos is all there ever was, all there is, and all there ever will be. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is that the material world is eternal. But it is Greek. They think that material, or materi uh, the material world, okay, is eternal, always was. Yeah, and that's why. And that the demiurge, or God, took the material, the pre-existing, and created all this stuff. Yeah. So God still had to be eternal. Mm -hmm. How does uh, the creation account characterize God's work? From strength to power. From dictation. He's a dictator. Okay. Pure will. Why is it significant that all things come into being through the word of God? And this is what you just said. What does this tell us about God's authority? He's got all authority and he's got the power to do it. And thank God he's a good God. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It sort of puzzles on, right? Yeah, that's sort of redundant, isn't it? Why is it significant that creation did not remain formless, but was formed and ordered by God? 
Why is that significant? Because we live in chaos. That's right. Because it has a design and it has a purpose. Otherwise, it would just be God just didn't create some atomic, subatomic matter and let it sit there. I, you I mean, know, the deists, for example, believe in God. And what do they believe? They believe that God created everything. They no problem with saying God created it. Where does their problem lie? Well, in the purpose and yeah. form. Yeah, that would be uh, people talk about theist, theistic evolution. So God created all the stuff and yeah. then went and watched the movie and yeah. he created this evolution process and the stuff just. Yeah. And the deist, particularly, was uh, God stepped back. He was like, it was like he made a watch and he wound it up and he stepped back. Now, interestingly enough, that breaks down today. Why? Because we have solar powered watches. <laughs> and, and even at one time, you had to watch that, you know, as you moved your arm, it wound itself and so forth. So the, the whole thing sort of fell apart because you were getting the source of power from somewhere else. But that, that's what the problem with the deist was. God stepped back and he's letting the world unwind. Now, that makes a little bit of sense when we see how the world is unwinding. Remember the Beatles song, The Fool on the Hill? Yeah. That song is, it said that God is a fool. He watches the world go round and yeah. round and, uh, and fool on the hill. And see, that, that's where what, we, what, what you term critical thinking is. See, it's not necessarily wrong to see a song like this. What is wrong is buying into it. And the critical thinker looks at things like that and says, okay, here's a song, it's catchy. I don't know, the lyrics are okay. But you start looking at it critically and you say, oh, wait a minute, life's not a circle. We understand that life is linear. So now we say to this song, no, this song is not correct. And that's where we get in trouble because one of the things we have not done a good job of with even my generation was critical thinking. You know, we didn't, you know, I wasn't taught to look at a song and say, hey, how does this fit a Christian biblical world in life view? You know, so, so, you know, if we were teaching our kids that, that was a good thing. We but, have to step back to music. Because you ever listen to Deutschland de Brahms? Uh, no, I can't say that I have. <laughs> it's, it's a song that pumps you up, and it's evil from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the thing. I mean, you can't, but too many people just listen to it and don't critically right. think through it. Yeah, but and, that's it and, that's, and, that, and, and I'm using music, but I'm also talking about literature. Movies. Movies, you know. Um, Every, everything, you know, and I've said this to you before, I think, in literature, you can pretty much tell what the philosophy of the day is by what you read. Mm -hmm. You know, the Romantic period uh, has a certain uh, type of literature. The Enlightenment has a certain type of literature, mm -hmm. and you, you, you can actually see it as you read the literature. Mm -hmm. Could the universe have caused itself into... Uh, to come into being, well, we know that that can't be the case. It's not logical. <laughs> and even people don't do that, do we? We don't be we're, we're conceived. We're not, you know, we're not, oh, okay. You know, how is God's creation of all things not a contradiction of the axiom that something cannot come from nothing? Must we say that God has a cause? Okay, there's two things. No, God does not have a cause. No. He's the uncaused cause. Right. And that's one of the problems. There's a, a proof for God called the teleological proof, where this caused this, caused this, caused this, caused this. And you have to have an uncaused cause. There has to be God. Otherwise, you've got an endless, infinite digression of causes. Right. And that can't be. There's got to be an uncaused cause. Right. Right. And so it's not a contradiction because God was eternal. So there was something, there was something. 
Many today claim that the description of God's creation in the beginning of Genesis is more akin to a fairy tale than reality. Why is it necessary that we interpret the creation account as a record of God's creative activity? What is lost if we do not? What, what sets the creation that we read in Genesis apart from any of the creation stories that come out of Greek or out of uh, heathen? There's a beginning. There's a beginning. Okay, but how did the Greeks look at creation? It's the circular so a word at the beginning of a circle. I know what but, it is. but how did they see how did they see things happening? In their in their thing of creation, what was going on that the creation happened? The gods were competing. Oh yes, the sea monsters and stuff. Yes, mm -hmm. the gods were competing. Mm -hmm. So now sea monsters, does that conjure up anything about evolution, maybe? <laughs> Um, well, Leviathan. Yeah. Well, but I'm talking about creation yeah. and the idea that oh, maybe there were sea monsters that walked out of the uh, out of the sea. Mm -hmm. You know, and so maybe evolution has its roots clear back there. Well, Neptune with his yeah. Trident. But uh, isn't it funny that they they go with darkness, light and darkness, bad and light. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I mean. It, you can't get out of yeah, and, the imprint of God in yeah, a human being. Yeah, and it gives equality to them because mm -hmm. they're competing. Where did God give equality to light and dark? No, he is light. No, he brought light. He yeah, brought yeah. light. He never said that darkness was good. No, and, and obviously, you know, when he made the creation, there was darkness and he brought light. He you know what's interesting, and I always thought this reading Genesis and that we have the physicist accounts of how things happen, then we have the account on earth. We had first we had uh, the earth was formed out of the material, and then there was the deep water, then came land, and then uh, God created light and darkness, and then he created the sea beast, the land beast. And the Genesis follows the exact order of what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And yet we deny it. Man was the apex of creation. Even a biologist would tell you that uh, they would say that we had the sea creatures, they come out, we had the land creatures, then we had this level of creature, and finally we had man. It's exactly what this says. And yet they, they refuse yes. to acknowledge it. And Herschel Walker is questioning evolution because he wonders why there are still gorillas. Why there's what? Why there are still gorillas. If, if we evolve from a gorilla, oh, yeah. they still there. Yeah. Which English word? Like to, <laughs> derived from the Greek means to be, to become, or to happen. Well, obviously. See. Yeah. Okay. What word best describes the biblical understanding of history? B. B. Linear. Which 19th century philosopher can be called the father of modern nihilism? Nietzsche. 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 Friedrich. What is the best translation of the Latin phrase creation ex nihilo? See. See. You know, it's interesting. You know, creation from something. Some folks try to say there had, had to be something. We just don't know what it was. Creation without meaning, yeah. you know, why? Why was there creation? Well, you know, the evolutionists really don't have a reason for creation, do they? The scientist doesn't have, have the answer to why. Um, and then creation from chaos, that's the idea that there was something there, but it wasn't together. It wasn't together, it was chaotic. God did not use pre existent matter to bring about the universe. Is that true or false? That's true. There was nothing. He was not That's there. right. Right. Oh, yeah, he brought, he made this stuff. Right? Yeah, he made it. He made this stuff. He made the stuff. Which Latin expression does Dr. Sproul use to refer to the divine imperative in creation? Theo. Yeah. Theo. Yeah. Oh, Felix the cat get in there. <laughs> no, it's Felix Copa. Copa. 
Felix Felix the cat. The cat. Mia culpa, what? what does Felix mean? Mia culpa is the I, I'm sorry, I just, what does Felix mean? I don't know, what's that? He's Ed a Sparrow. What, Mr. Lat, I don't know. E.G. E is an and. Et. Et and. Et. Something in uh, facts and. As R.C. says. Speculation. As, as R.C. says, it's the past tense of eat. <laughs> <laughs> I have the need because I have a great. I can. Okay. Felix okay. Culpa means fortunate fault. Fortunate fault. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A, yeah. A, fortune, a fortunate accident. I didn't know that. Okay. That's from the encyclopedia. Huh. All right. Next week, we're going to look at the uh, dignity of man. I'll try the other video and see if it's a little better. I don't know if there's a way that I can fix that because it's this computer that's doing that. Because when I do it at home and I work on it at home, I'm not having this type of thing. Yeah. So it might be that there's an adjustment that can be made on that. Yeah. So, so. If you download it from the internet, but then you can't record it. So, you know. Well, that was coming right off the internet today. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh. it's coming through. There's something going on with the computer here that is, is creating a problem. Because it is, um, that, that was the Connect website. So, but there's another place on Ligonier's that has these two. It's easier if I uh, read the scripture and I just listen. <laughs> yeah. Kind of close yeah. your eyes. Otherwise, my mind has to follow him. It's, it's like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? It was, it was like that Sunday that we were doing the uh, streaming and from my place, yeah. and uh, we were like just a tad ahead of what was going on uh, over the internet. <laughs> so when people were singing, particularly, it wasn't so bad when we were doing the doing doing some of the uh, uh, recitations. But the songs were like, oh, you know, that was, that was not good. So I, I, the only thing I know about Mary is that the surgery was successful, whatever she had. It was her wrist. It was her wrist. I sent them an email. I told them I was praying for him. And uh, uh, Dean sent me back things saying her wrist is doing well. Okay. So she had some type of orthopedic surgery okay. or something on her wrist. Okay. So it wasn't a... Because you don't know, my goodness, is she, what's going on? Right? Yeah, right. I wish, you know, I wish they would have told us that. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of times people just don't want to. They don't like to. They, they don't like to have mm -hmm. people uh, take their time for things. And, right. So, uh, oh, I have these. Um, <laughs> these are those. Uh, this is that letter that's from the. Uh, uh, Maps stuff, is that what it's called? Oh, Mapta. we have this. Yeah. Oh, you have that? We have. Bible teachers and okay. And it's got a testimony in here. Yeah, it's academic and it's, it's not personalized. Yeah. So, um, well, got a golf tournament in there. Can't be all bad. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I've got one too. I know you do. I, I know. Did I send you the stuff on there? You did. I'm okay. trying to drum up a foursome. Okay. Okay. Um, of course, Steve and Marlene are going to be heading up to uh, Canada this yeah. week for the funeral of. Uh, that was Marlene's cousin. Niece. 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 Yeah. Niece. She left two teenage children. Yeah. 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 And she was telling me that she is pretty much quarantined while she was under care for this, and that's longer than the pandemic. She was quarantined. So she was living one place, and her husband was the kids somewhere else. So they haven't even been together for a couple of years. That's insane. And uh, I've tried to tell Steve, don't worry about getting back quickly. He you know, will. Well, I think, I, what I told him was, if you see that you need to be up there to minister to these folks, okay. then you stay up there, because this is your family. You minister to people that are not your family all the time. Okay. This is this should be a real priority. That's right. So, um, and Tuesday is kind of an interesting day for Marilyn and I, as we're going to be uh, going up to see my sister, who I haven't seen, I think, in about four years. She, mm -hmm. she lives in Raleigh. We have not been 
we've not been real close, obviously, over the years. And um, but in the last few months, she has really made an effort to be in touch with me. And she, she seems to be really excited that we're coming. So, uh, so I'm hoping Joan and I will be going. Well, that's right. possibly yeah for two weeks, depending on how her test going. Out. So she's adamant we're going. I'm like hesitant, but we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father. Um, we thank you, Lord, for whatever reason, and we know what the reason is. You wanted people to worship and glorify you, and we know that that's the reason that you did. You made this creation, and so, Lord, we we uh, we thank you for that. And as we are uh, considering things today, we pray that you'll continue to uh, uh, be with Mary as she convalesces from this surgery. That. Uh, She'll be able to be back with us uh, uh, quickly. We pray too for Steve and Marlene as they travel and uh, that uh, they are able to give comfort to uh, the rest of the family as, as, uh, uh, as, as Steve and Marlene give comfort to those of us here at Shear and as they did at Prosperity as well. And uh, so we, we pray, Lord, that they'll understand that this is a time for their family. Yes. And Lord, uh, we pray that uh, you'll be with. Uh, 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 Bill and Joan, as they uh, are making uh, plans to go to Florida, and we ask for that uh, uh, that those plans would be fulfilled, and uh, we ask for that uh, all the issues that need to be addressed will be addressed, and they'll be able to uh, uh, make their trip. So, Lord, now God of creation, we we look forward to coming and worshiping you. We look forward, Lord, to being a part of your family uh, coming together. And so we ask that uh, those of us that are here and those that will be watching online, that we'll be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Um, we pray today that uh, you'll be with Jim as he uh, leaves the service. And we pray, Lord, to uh, also uh, be with Steve as he brings the message. And Lord, we thank you and praise you. Uh, for all things in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, just so you know, in your prayers, twice now, John has lost the use of her left arm. Yeah. He come down, yeah, it happened again. She come downstairs, and she, her, just an appendage hanging there. She can't move it or do anything. In about 15 to 20 minutes, it restores and back to normal in that. So, is it a TIA, a pre-stroke? What is it? No one knows. The neurologist has no idea. It's kind of scary. Yeah, sure. So, but I mean, she came down and into my office and said, "Bill, I can't use my 